Hi, how are you guys? Fine, fine, fine. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Bojai. Yeah. I, did I miss something about ties? Because I'm not in one. So <laughs> no, 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 no. We are... <laughs> I'm having fun with the new chairman. <laughs> Yeah, Maybe he, he's changed the standard. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> there I don't know like whether it's... You're freezing no, a bit. I don't know whether it's my internet. I, I, I guess all very clear. Uh, How do we it's my you are, internet. You're freezing a little bit. You're like. freezing a bit, Rajan. Yeah. Yeah, let, let, let me just... Let me just sort out my internet. Okay. Hi, Ronnie, how are you? Very good, Grace, how are you? Um, fine, thank you. So I'm just checking on sound and the camera. Uh, yours is good to go. All right, so I can yeah. not take a bit of a break. Yeah, in interesting developments over the weekend on this thing. We might need one uh, every week. Well, what? Which one are yeah. you talking about? Because there are many developments. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Over the weekend, so much happened uh, around the election. It's, it's Around the election, yeah. The it's Kenyan not... election is just something else. It, it, it was looking very calm, I think. We were, we were kind of calmly <laughs> confident. It's all in hand. Then suddenly, it's like, oh my God. Yeah. Kenyan elections for you. Every Everything is in the air. Yeah, let's mm -hmm. hope. Yeah, they sort it out together. Hi, Joe. Hi, Job. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, uh, everybody, including uh, the board chair, uh, the former chair. Good afternoon. Afternoon. Afternoon, Job. Sorry, I think my my speaker is, is muted. We can hear you. you can hear me now. Thanks so much. Uh, yeah. yeah uh, so we are here uh, so that uh, we can uh, run through the program. The first is that uh, welcome all of us uh, to this session. Uh, thanks for this, this good idea that was initiated by, uh, by the board chair uh, that we have this session so that we can update our members on uh, uh, the state of election preparedness, uh, what CAM has been doing the background as far as the elections are concerned and uh, how then we can ensure that there is operational continuity of the manufacturing sector during this period. Uh, so first is to check. Job, yes. we have two panelists missing. Yeah, yeah, that's what I wanted to check. <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I wanted to check uh, who is present and so that uh, those who is the panel who is, which is not present, uh, we can follow up with them. Uh, so like what uh, the former chair is talking about, uh, two are not present. Uh, so Grace, you can make for a follow-up on the same. Let me call, I'll call, I'm also calling, I'll see. Okay, so then we can give ourselves uh, like two other minutes uh, for this confirmation before we start because uh, just a small confirmation of our program. Um, Grace, Kwame doesn't have his panelist link. All right. Sure. Mm -hmm. Just check, could you send it to him? Let me see if I can share with him. And also, Nerima Wako, I think you can see Nerima. Yeah, let me see.
Chris, you managed to share the to share the link. Uh, yes, Kwame is on. Yes, Kwame is on. Okay, uh, so that means. I think Nerima, did you check Nerima's? But I couldn't get her on phone. Uh, well, let me reach out. I'll, I'll I'll send her a message. Let's see. Okay, uh, Chair, uh, because we have only three minutes. Ms. Uh, Mr. Mshai, I would recommend that uh, we can look into the program as uh, Nanima uh, joins. Uh, so to start off, uh, we're going to have the acting CEO uh, making the uh, welcoming remarks. And after that, we're going to have our chair, Mr. Rajan Shah, uh, making some remarks also for about 10 minutes. But thereafter, I'm going to invite uh, Institute of Economic Affairs uh, CEO, Bona Kwame Owino, to also make remarks for about 20 minutes, oh, sorry, 12 minutes. Then uh, as we follow up on Rima Wako, uh, who is MD for Siasa Place uh, to join, uh, she's also going to make remarks for 12 minutes. For then we can have uh, Tony Blair East, uh, East Africa Regional Director, and that is uh, Ronnie Osuba, also making some uh, remarks uh, for about 12 minutes. Uh, thereafter, we're going to get into uh, question and answer session uh, uh, for a period of uh, about one minute. Uh, and then uh, we'll have some closing remarks uh, uh, thereafter uh, uh, coming from myself. Uh, so that's how the program is running. And uh, I would like to hear whether you have any comments uh, on the program. Uh, we have two minutes to the launch uh, of the webinar. Uh, so this time uh, to uh, listen to this. Okay. I think Job, sorry, Job, just some advice on the cameras like we usually do. We keep yeah. the cameras off during the presentations, but during the panel, uh, do we keep them on or if you're answering a question? How do you want the... Uh, chair, uh, you are noticing something? I'm okay. saying the cameras. Yes. We need them on during introduction. Yes, we can have them during the introduction. And uh, once one has uh, finished the introduction, then you can uh, put it off. Put it off until uh, you're speaking to. Yeah. Together with yeah. the microphone. Yeah. Yes. OK. OK. Uh, so at least uh, as we go on uh, with uh, getting feedback from uh, the panelists, uh, you could be looking at the objectives and the possible outcomes of the, of the webinar that you're holding today. Yeah, and Nerima is also here. Thanks for joining us. Oh, great. great. Hey, Nerima, um, if you don't mind, you can just say a quick hello and then switch on your camera briefly. Oh, hello, everyone. Um, sorry, I'm late. <laughs> I thought I was on time. Um, but glad to be here. Uh, all right. Do you mind switching on your camera? Just just, just check on it. All right, thank you. Looks good. Uh, Kwame, how are you? Uh, fine, thank you. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Uh, if you don't mind, you can switch on your camera for a bit. All right. Yeah. All right, uh, looks good. Um, Job, I think you're good on my end. Uh, you can take over the program. Okay, great. Uh, I think then we are all reading from uh, this, the same page now. Uh, uh, 
Oh, okay. Yes, Chair. Yes, Chair. Chair, can you hear me? Because yes. I seem to be having some internet connectivity problem. Are you able? Are you able to hear me well? Yes, I can hear you, well, Chair. I'm. I'm because on my side, I see things breaking up. Uh, I, I'm seeing intermittent kind of, but I'll try anyway. Let because there's some internet challenge I have here. <clears throat> okay. Okay. We can hear you hear you well, and I hope it continues. Yes. Like that. Otherwise, I'll have to keep my camera off. Oh, yeah, so I can stream, it can stream better. Get a uh, good bandwidth, yeah. Okay. okay. Okay, Grace, then you can, uh, you can, uh, you can uh, advise when we can start off this. Uh, please go ahead. I can see you have 26 on the call as the others join. Okay, great. So, stop share. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, Come board chair. Uh, come board members, uh, sector chairs, and chapter chairs, uh, come members present, uh, all protocols observed. I will come here to this webinar on election preparedness. My name is uh, Joe Bonjohi. I'm the head of policy research and advocacy at Kenya Association of Manufacturers, and I'll be uh, the moderator for the session. Uh, we hold this webinar to update our esteemed members on election preparedness and need to ensure operational and policy dis, uh, minimal, uh, uh, to ensure minimal operational and policy disruption uh, during this period. And that is uh, before the elections, uh, during the election and after the elections or post election. Uh, this will safeguard optimal capacity utilization, uh, continued and sustained turnovers, uh, healthy top lines and bottom lines of the manufacturing fraternity. And I expect your full participation in the listening and via Zoom uh, chat platform. Via platform. Uh, the elections are pegged on our, our constitution. So what we are exercising is a constitutional mandate. Uh, also you'll find uh, it sits uh, in the election act. Uh, when we talk of the political parties act, uh, the independent electoral borders commission act, uh, all these is talking about the elections. Uh, subsequently, uh, that's the reason why we have this importance exercise coming after five years and the need for us uh, to talk uh, to our members on the need of getting prepared and uh, what is this state of preparedness, uh, what this state of preparedness means. Uh, so it is going to take us one and a half hours uh, to run this program. And uh, to start off uh, the program, we'll have the CAM Act CEO, uh, Tobaz Alando, uh, making, uh, uh, making his opening remarks uh, before he invites CAM board chair. It is worth noting that we'll keep our members updated regularly on election uh, preparedness. And also to let you note that uh, it is your right to go and vote uh, so that you can make a decision that is quite important uh, for this country. Uh, for seamless execution of this program, uh, I'm going to advise you that you observe the following. Uh, please mute when you're not speaking. I'll be the timekeeper for the uh, speakers and panelists that we speak uh, stick within the 12 minutes or the 14 minutes or the 20 minutes that one has been allocated to. Uh, in case you have any uh, question that you want to ask, there is a, a chat function uh, on the Zoom uh, platform uh, that you can uh, uh, write the questions and uh, we can answer live or we can answer verbally. Uh, if you want to address your question to a specific pre presenter, uh, please state their names uh, when you uh, uh, state their names when you ask uh, the question. At this time, now I want to welcome uh, come CEO you uh, to make intro intro introductory uh, remarks uh, before I invite uh, Cam Chair. Karibu, uh, Tobias. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Job, and um, thank you to our Chairman uh, Rajan Shah and uh, outgoing chair Mushai Kunina and all our speakers present this morning, uh, this afternoon, and the members. Thank you for joining this discussion around election preparedness. We are holding today's session about 14 days uh, to the elections, and campaigns, as you have witnessed, are on the top gear. As you are aware, our elections are held after every five years which normally comes with a high level of uncertainty. Uh, this year's elections 
uh, are held at a time when we are grappling with the effects of COVID-19 and the Russia-Ukraine war. This current state of event is key, a key area of concern for manufacturing and manufacturing sectors as large. Business in the past have um, been at a standstill during this period, and that is why it is a major concern for every investor in this country um, to have a conversation around election preparedness. And this is the reason why we, we are holding this uh, session. Uh, as KM is concerned, every election cycle, uh, we develop a manifesto to guide our engagement with the political aspirants. Uh, this is majorly because we recognize uh, that realizing the gains that local industry presents requires a step up in policy support. Practical imp implementation can only be achieved when the government works in partnership with the business community while building sufficient public and private capacity to innovate. Uh, we have identified under our manifesto are key areas and we've been engaging with uh, the political candidates on these areas. So in, in, the, in, the, in the forefront of advocacy and engagement of the candidates, I think we are uh, uh, on top uh, in terms of engaging both the political wing and the technical wing of, of, of these candidates. And we hope that these conversations will continue uh, even after the elections. However, of concern to us and uh, what is at play at the moment is that we need to ensure that the elections are held uh, in a peaceful manner and the industry continue to function as normal. So bearing in mind the ensuing conversation on the upcoming general election, our discussion shall focus on the following. One, the risks and opportunities in the upcoming general election how to make informed operational and strategic decisions for the coming period and exchange best practices. I believe we, we learned from the past elections so we could be able to share our best uh, practices in regards to the past elections. We avoid the pitfalls that we may have experienced in the past and forge forward to um, a productive uh, and uh, an, ac a, a, an acceptable election that will, will have peace and coherence amongst ourselves. We've lined up speakers who shall share insight on this and many more. I urge you to actively participate in the session using the Q&A and the chat uh, section. I wish you all a fruitful session and thank you. Over to you, Job. Uh, thank you, Tobias, uh, for making those uh, opening remarks. Uh, uh, at this point now, I want to invite our board chair, uh, Mr. Rajansha, uh, to also make his remarks. Okay, thank you, Job, and thank you, Tobias. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm having some internet challenges, so I'm uh, going to kind of, uh, I've connected to my phone. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, all the participants here today. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge uh, some of our panelists here. Uh, the Regional Director, East Africa, Tony Blair Institute for Global Change, uh, Ronnie Osumba. Uh, we also have our good friend uh, from the Institute of Economic Affairs, uh, CEO Kwame Owino. Uh, from Siasa Place, Executive Director, Nerima Wako. Our acting CEO, Tobias, all members present here, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good afternoon uh, to have you all here. And uh, today is probably my, I'm glad to say my first event as the chair of CAMP. I was just installed uh, last week as the chair. And by the way, I also want to acknowledge the presence of our immediate past chair, Nchai Kunia, who is also present here today. Uh, <clears throat> Good afternoon, all. And uh, as you all are aware, that Kenya Association of Manufacturers uh, is a, a fact based business organization which uh, secures the, uh, it does advocacy to secure the future of industry uh, in this country and in this region. And uh, to that end, it will continue advocating with all the key partners and stakeholders. Uh, both in government and outside government towards achieving this goal so that we can 
aspire to achieve the 20, Vision 2030 goal of 15% uh, of uh, GDP, manufacturing being the 15% uh, of GDP. It's in this period that we actively participate in policy making and during this election period, all more the reason to engage with all the political uh, parties and actors and uh, uh, from uh, all sorts of, uh, uh, all, all uh, from all areas. And as a result of that, we, 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 we do not kind of select and we are apolitical as an organization. Um, so as during this election period, I mean, of course, the election itself is a very fundamental kind of event in, in any democracy. And it enables us to bring uh, elect leaders who will, uh, good leaders who will uh, be instrumental in driving the national's development goal. Uh, but as we always notice uh, election, during the election period, it becomes a very destructive time when uh, businesses slow down, uh, businesses would want to kind of kind of uh, slow down their ordering, uh, stocking, uh, and uh, also investors kind of uh, slow down their investment decisions, whether they are from local investors or also foreign investors. And this, of course, has a very adverse uh, impact on the job and wealth creation uh, uh, for our sector and. Uh, and it's it's because of this uh, we that we need to continuously keep engaging with uh, all our political parties and actors around this period to ensure that there is we can bring some level of stability to businesses. Uh, so, what are the engagements uh, at CAM that uh, we, we 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 do during this period? Uh, as an association, we have been engaging political parties and leaders with the aim of sharpening the focus uh, on issue-based uh, politics. And that's, that's very key that uh, it's, it's all very issue-based so that uh, th we are talking about things that impact our citizens and our businesses uh, and to bring and offer practical solutions on how to kind of uh, address some of these challenges. Uh, political goodwill is, of course, uh, very essential to ensure that we uphold good governance uh, at both levels, national and county level of government. We have done this uh, through various initiatives, both at the national and government level. We have actually been participating in various debates during this period uh, by political parties. Uh, we also, as you know, uh, CAM is also one of the sponsors of the presidential debates. Uh, which is currently, uh, we've already had two of them, uh, the Nairobi gubernatorial and the deputy uh, presidential. And tomorrow we have the presidential debate uh, going on. And this engagement is important so that we bring at the forefront, uh, what are the areas around uh, manufacturing and industry uh, so that as, as, as this political parties kind of uh, uh, look at where, where the uh, development agenda is, then our, our industry agenda is not uh, left uh, or forgotten. I mean, it's not forgotten in the process. Um, in terms of institutional support, uh, obviously the vision 2030 aspires Kenya to pursue issue-based politics. And uh, as such, elect electoral mobilization should center around uh, aspirants manifestos. And this is what we debate with uh, all the uh, political actors on what their agenda and manifesto around industrialization is. Uh, the 2010 constitution made great efforts in creating various uh, institutional frameworks to ensure growth of democracy and political stability. This includes uh, institutions like the uh, Independent uh, uh, Electoral Boundaries Commission, the police, the registrar of political parties and the dispute re resolution. Uh, mechanism and such institutions require political support to uh, discharge their the mandate of the elections effectively. As we approach the elections, IEBC requires support, and in and in case there are issues that require attention, they should be addressed expeditiously to the satisfaction of all parties. IEBC should consider giving regular updates to instill public confidence. Additionally, they should make sure that. They have sealed all loopholes from previous elections and also from the 
whatever was identified in the Supreme Court from the nullified uh, 2017 elections. The private sector hopes that there will be no electoral disputes and if they are, they are addressed it within the legal framework. With those few remarks, uh, members, uh, I wish that we, I wish all to go and peacefully uh, do, do, do your constitutional uh, mandate of uh, going and electing uh, the next government. And we wish all uh, a peaceful elections. And as we uh, come out of the elections, let's all roll up our sleeves and build this nation and the manufacturing and the industry. Thank you. And let's have some fruitful discussions today. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chair, uh, for those great remarks. Indeed, uh, you're pointing out uh, the need to ensure that we have tight uh, electoral process, or in other words, what I call a process that has military precision uh, so that we minimize the disputes as much as possible. Uh, and also you have called in your speech uh, that is a need, there's need uh, that uh, the, the best that this period uh, we, uh, th that during this period, the process is taken with a lot of care because the various partner decisions that, have, uh, that can be made at the business level, uh, given how uh, the elections are handled. Also, you have talked about the issue-based politics and the importance of ensuring that this happens uh, and that uh, CAM has been at the forefront, ensuring that uh, we are supporting this through uh, manifesto development, uh, presidential debates, uh, talk of uh, uh, meeting specific presidential candidates uh, and also in case we have various issues arising during this period we have a amicable uh, settlement of our electoral dispute thanks so much uh, chair uh, for these remarks at uh, this point now i want to welcome our great friend uh, to kenya Zisho manufacturers uh, that is the uh, institute of economic affairs uh, ceo abona kwame owino uh, owino to also make uh, his remarks All right, uh, sorry. Okay, uh, good afternoon everybody and, and thanks for the kind introduction. Um, I'm Kwame Wino from the IEA and I'm glad to be here. So I have 12 minutes to speak to you about um, what's the state of the economy now and, and what is it that the new administration might, will definitely be dealing with. And then to take about maybe five minutes to just go through some of the salient features in the four uh, manifestos that we've seen. So let me start with the, 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 the fact that uh, a small brief that the IEA has prepared shows us that um, since Kenya's um, um, independence, um, we've had 12 elections, or well, this would be the 12th. And in all those, uh, there tends to be, there's always been um, the, the year that coincides with an election tends to be in a five year cycle, one of the lowest or a slowdown in growth, that is the gross domestic product. Uh, suggesting to us that there's something about the politics that affects or depresses economic uh, performance for those elections years. And I think it suggests that um, it's actually also a justification for what your chair said, that maybe there's some jitters uh, that the private sector picks, but is also available on the um, households and farm side, based on government behavior or just the management of the elections in general. So definitely all of us have uh, a common interest regardless of political outcome, for the elections to be managed soundly, and at least to the extent that is possible to try and reduce the effect of that uh, depression in economic growth. And this depression in economic growth has actually been, I think many people emphasize the post uh, 1992, which basically suggests that it's a feature of uh, the intensity of elections campaigns, but actually we've had it since independence. So it tells us that uh, the country has not successfully and maybe it shouldn't happen, successfully divorced um, economic performance from the big uh, economic, um, the big decisions regarding political choice. Um, but we've seen that in 2017, regardless of the very long period after that, actually it had uh, very low. So basically what it suggests is that since 2007, it's been systematically reducing, suggesting that some lessons have been baked in um, that may show that um, increasingly, uh, that disruption does not take place for long, and it allows for successful, I mean, for a resumption of economic activity as quickly as is possible. Um, we think that this particular year, however, might be different for the reason that there's a convergence in um, 
some difficulties that we carried over, um, global politics and global um, tensions, but also global economic affairs at the same time as when a handover uh, in government will occur. All that notwithstanding actually tells us that yes, we all have an even bigger role or an even bigger claim to ensuring that the management of elections and uh, the institutions that have their work are ready to perform their work well, so that uh, whatever the problems that may come from externally, which obviously can be managed through policy, at least this political moment passes uh, without creating undue disruptions, but also delaying any recovery that should happen uh, quickly. So that's, that's one. Now, what are the things that we think are essential? I think the essential things today are uh, inflation, and inflation has two parts. There are parts of the inflation that we see that comes from domestic uh, sources, and there are parts that come from external sources. So the external source of inflation is basically that Kenya imports oil. Oil is the biggest petroleum, crude petroleum, uh, petroleum and petroleum products, the biggest single uh, item that Kenya imports, that this country imports. So if global prices go um, as they've been going because of tensions, um, they went up, obviously they've been down last week alone, they're I think down by 4%. Um, if that trend continues, that's necessarily a good thing because then the price effect into Kenya would be much less than it would be if prices re remained above $120. $120. Uh, per barrel. Of course, right now, coming down to less than 110, anybody would take that price compared to the 120, especially because Kenya also has the problem of the depreciation of the currency. I think our view at the Institute of Economic Affairs is that it was going to happen regardless. And this, I mean, if it is allowed to smoothly happen, that will be better without disruption. So one factor globally is ensuring that prices are coming down uh, for petroleum. Um, obviously, the only restraint in terms of it's not coming down completely is the value of the Kenyan shilling, which is still uh, set to depreciate a little further. Um, and if that happens, obviously, I think there'll be some stability for the time being so that you don't have shocks from two sides. The other side is uh, uh, inflation driver is food. Food also has an external point and an internal one. Now, of the three main cereals, which is uh, wheat, maize, and rice, uh, I think for wheat, external dependence is 80%. For rice, I think slightly above 50%. And for, for maize, uh, about 40% to get about six fluctuates, but it's now we about 35% to about 40, 42 or 47, uh, depending on, on, on how rains uh, occur. So with imports, obviously most of the major importers, I mean, rather part of the big exports uh, come from both Russia and Ukraine and the invasion of Russia by Ukraine, of course, has created a tension spot. Uh, there was an agreement last week, but as we all had yesterday, one of the ports through which this grain is supposed to get into the rest of the world was, was um, attacked. And that might even delay it further and obviously create more shocks in the global uh, prices of, of grain. Um, then that in, in turn as well, will have a, um, a lag effect, but it will obviously show up in Kenya as well. But there's also a domestic problem in terms of I think we've had, for the last five years, we've had at least two years in which both the long and the short rains were inadequate. Because of that, the compounded effect of that is that the harvest this year were, last year were late. And then of course the rains this year were also late. So obviously that has created the tension, especially on the side of, of maize. And what government has done in responding to it is, we know that a couple of days back, the government introduced a system for subsidies. Uh, we think it is very inefficiently designed but nevertheless, we understand that the intentions are okay, uh, poorly designed, and I think the design of this program is going to, is going to affect it. But nevertheless, it's created some, uh, 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 it's absorbed some tension, whether it's only for a month to allow for the government to, to, I mean, for the transition to take place, I think the next government will make that decision about whether to maintain it or not. Um, so there's 8 billion shillings available to, to, to feed into the, into the, into the, uh, 8 billion shillings available to feed into the subsidy. Um, poorly designed, but nevertheless, it's not going to have a zero effect. So those two are up there. And as you can see, there's some good uh, vibes coming from externally, but also obviously in Kenya, there's going to be harvest. I think it will be suboptimal, but it will help um, the prices, especially of maize, when the harvest does occur because they'll be available. Government has also made the decision to actually suspend some levies. 
and to allow and also quotas to allow for maize to come in both from the region and other parts of the world. So all that means that it will be available. The income shock that came to that household suffered from on account of COVID is what is going to determine to what extent um, people are able to afford food. Because we think that if you look at global supplies and the possibility of opening, I think it will not be like, um, it is much clearer to us now that global supplies will not be the problem. I think the problem will be um, supply chains, which are also being corrected. So the, what, what remains is whether people will have the incomes and therefore a subsidy um, is useful, um, even if we at the IGS still insist that it was very poorly designed. Uh, there's also the fuel subsidy in Kenya. Um, a very expensive subsidy um, ongoing as well. Um, and our view is it's not a good thing because when the shock, when the subsidy is suspended, because I don't think, we don't think at the IEA the government of Kenya could maintain a subsidy about 15 billion shillings for a year. It will not be possible. Um, 15 billion shillings a month for a year, it will not be possible. Um, and as the prices go higher, then obviously that tension between the real price and the subsidized price is even higher. And with the problems in tax collection, uh, it's not possible that all of us will actually, that will be useful for the deficit. Uh, there's been an announcement from Treasury, which is important, I think, to prepare everybody for the fact that the subsidy will be eased, uh, phased out towards the end of this year. And there's a confirmation last week that in the, uh, the discussion between government's partners, IMF, and Treasury, and all the other authorities, there's an agreement that it will be phased out over time. So if that maintains because of the agreement in place, regardless of what um, administration, administration take over, takes over in September, whenever it happens, uh, then at least there's time for preparation. But then the most important thing for us is that if there's a shock, or rather, if there's a 30% subsidy on a product, um, when that is phased out, obviously there's going to be some kind of shock on the supply side, I mean, on the demand side. So that's, that's one thing to consider. Now, let me go quickly now to, because my time is up to just a rundown of what the main coalitions have uh, as part of their content. So if you start with the Kenya Kwanzaa, which, uh, which had it the other time, I think everybody emphasizes agriculture, the understanding that, that agriculture is a major um, source of income for Kenyan households. So obviously agriculture and the highlight for Kenya Kwanzaa's manifesto is basically to bring in what is called the minimum guaranteed return. It has its pros and cons. We think it's a very, very poor choice. Uh, but let's start with the fact that Kenya Kwanzaa, in our view, had the most comprehensive uh, analysis of what the state of the economy is uh, and some of the problems and the tensions. Their solutions not always match what they have described, but that's the nature of the political process. It's about what is what they consider politically feasible. Then they have an, a big fund, which is basically for SMEs, for, for funding SMEs and micro and small enterprises. Um, and they talk more responsibly about debt management. Uh, I think they said something about they'll be considering the debt stock and how to manage it. Uh, I think their leader men mentioned a while back that they will not be going for restructuring, which is interesting. Uh, I think it means they have some things out their pockets that they do. But the one thing that they made that is very clear to us is that there'll be a reduction um, in expenditure on manufacturing, especially, uh, rather, sorry, not manufacturing, on infrastructure. Let me make sure. They make it very clear that there'll be a reduction on investment in infrastructure. And what they say is that instead, an infrastructure fund will be established. And from that infrastructure fund, uh, from the proceeds, I think, of privatization, I and mean, from that infrastructure fund, that uh, infrastructure investments will be made so that basically infrastructure will not be driven by a supply side, but basically a great consideration about what the needs are. Sensible. I go to the Azimio, uh, the coalition. Um, they, too, acknowledge the growth in agriculture and have some proposals for support of agriculture. Um, talking about, of course, both. I mean, all of them speak about um, subsidies and ensuring that, infra uh, that uh, fertilizers come in, in at good costs. Um, they do some strong arguments about facilitating manufacturing in Kenya. Uh, they speak specifically about restructuring the debt, which some people thought actually spooked the markets. Um, when they spoke later, they said they intended to reprofile the debt, which is basically stretching it. Whichever way it is, they seem to also understand that the debt problem is a, is a big question. Um, they are talking about shared prosperity. And then obviously, you know about the other things. There's Babacare, there's Magic Waboma, which is to try and make sure that within the five-year plan, every household or every uh, homestead will have uh, available water. And we've had this before. The plan about how to extract it is not 
done, but they acknowledge the fact that part of the biggest problems is actually to put the infrastructure in place and then therefore to have the others come in. Uh, coming to the Roots Party, the Roots Party has some very radical proposals, among them obviously uh, about, uh, we think that while everybody is hung up with their suggestions about uh, um, decriminalization of, of marijuana or cannabis, for instance, I think they did not distinguish about whether they're talking about decriminalization for, for recreational use or for industrial purposes and the extraction of pharmaceuticals. Because in some of the statements that they say, they speak about one or the other, but I think that's an essential, essential part. But they say some things about strengthening the constitution and other parts talk about suspending parts of the constitution that do not work, um, which is, uh, is an, inter an interesting thing as well. And then the uh, Agano party, um also the stress if you read it a uh, strong uh, religious ethos um in itself not bad but we think i think they run the risk of some of the claims that they make would be unconstitutional for instance saying that uh, public sector will finance the payment of of um christian specifically christian and religious preachers to resolve uh private problems and uh, make questions or make uh, allude to rather to the question about Kadis and, and, and religious courts that we've had in other sectors. Uh, they speak about minimum guaranteed return as well for agriculture. Do they talk about it as maximum? We think that's a, that's a misprint. Uh, at the same time, um, placing agriculture in a premium place, even suggesting in one of the interviews that the minister president will, will himself be responsible for agriculture. I think that is incompatible with the constitutional provision. So obviously I think what they're saying is that agriculture will have a very big phase. And then mention as well that manufacturers will be enabled um, through reducing the cost of electricity, which all the four um, main presidential candidates actually emphasize. What they don't say is in what way, except for Kenya Kwanzaa, which states specifically uh, that the Kenya power will be released to act entirely as a commercial function with government responsible for regulation. So ladies and gentlemen, that's a quick rundown and I hope it's given you a grasp. The Institute of Economic Affairs conducted some analysis on all four. We have presentations available on the IEA website and we are writing up uh, a 15 pager which will summarize what the content is. So thank you very much, Good job. Thanks everyone. Uh, thanks so much uh, uh, Kwame uh, for running us quickly uh, on your remarks. The right to note that uh, inflation kicks in uh, during such periods, and uh, there are those measures that you can take uh, domestically uh, so that we ensure uh, this is checked. You have right to note of a few challenges uh, that, are, that are, are being experienced at the moment, and uh, they, all, uh, they all inform the inflation rates, including the fuel, uh, the food pricing, be it wheat, maize, edible oil, and whatnot. On top of this, the exchange rate that has been a bit turbulent uh, for the last uh, couple of months. Uh, indeed, uh, the analysis we've conducted is showing that uh, we have had a depreciation of cash shilling by almost, th by almost 14% uh, in the last uh, two years. So it has a bearing on the inflation rate. Uh, also noting that the manifestos that are coming from uh, various political parties, Safina, Root Party, Kenya Kwanza, and Lazimio, they're attempting to answer uh, on the macro macroeconomic questions that are linger in our mind every day. And most importantly noting that some of the manifestos have captured the manufacturing sector. It's leaders come. Uh, we want to ensure that uh, after the general elections, we have uh, a, a robust discussion uh, with the winning party or with the winning coalition uh, so that we can sit the manufacturing better. But also we're ensuring that uh, the policy documents that will inform the, the, the government that's coming up, uh, we have uh, put our input in them, including like now budget uh, policy statement, or, if, or if, even the media term uh, expenditure plan. Uh, at this time now, uh, thanks so much Kwame uh, for that presentation. At this time now, I want to invite uh, Nerima Wako, uh, who is the MD uh, for CSA Place for another 12 minutes, so that also, also she can make her remarks. Thank you so much uh, for having me, Job, and thank you, everybody. I'm glad to be here. Uh, so for me, I think I will share my screen. It's easier for me to speak while I look at something. Um, 
there. So as mentioned, I am the executive director of Siasa Place, and a lot of the information in this report comes from ELOG. Siasa Place is a member within ELOG, and it was formed in 2015. I also sit on the Youth Coordinating Committee to IBC, uh, which was formed in October 2021. We served for three years. I am the vice chair in that committee. And my work is basically youth engagement. So online, offline. So we do a number of campaigns in relation to voter registration and education and participation. So for me, it's to talk about the selection and the preparedness of this election. And I just wanted to share some facts about the election. So in total, there are 16,000 candidates. And that basically means that they are less than 2,000 positions that they are squabbling for. There are 46,233 polling stations, and this is because the law permits only 700 people per station, and because our population increased to 50 million, so that means that they also had to increase the polling stations. And then we're also going to talk about the procurement timelines and the fact that um, the public doesn't have confidence in IPC, and also the audit of the voter register and the 2017 electronic systems. We all remember what happened in 2017. A lot of times with my engagement with young people, they normally ask, why didn't they open the servers? And what is IBC doing differently this time? Something else that I see a little bit different with this election is independent candidates and the rise of them. 2017, we had a number and it grew uh, in 2022. 2022, a lot of them are young people who are vying as independent candidates, but was the commission a little bit too hard on them? We have seen the case with Kigame and the fact that it's still going back and forth uh, with the courts. So what's different, uh, Azimio and the zoning? The zoning has impacted a lot. Um, you would think that ethnicity wouldn't be so much a subject matter, but it has actually infiltrated toward what level to where people are now negotiating with the MCA position and looking at tribe. And, and this is something that I find fascinating. And also the fact that um, a lot of young people, again, missed in the nominations because of the direct nominations going into more influential people within the parties. The state funds that are being utilized in this election, there's a lot of money on both sides um, that is public resources, and no one is really being held accountable. And so we're seeing a lot of traveling and gallivanting, and I believe that the next administration, whoever it's going to be, is going to have to figure out a way to come up with those resources. And then public officials openly campaigning. This is something also that's quite new to me. Um, the fact that we have someone like CS ICT uh, openly sharing that he is within Azimio supporting Raula Odinga, and the fact that he controls ICT, a lot of people are worried in terms of the integrity of IBC and maybe the involvement. I think you guys remember when Safari Forum was trying to ask everyone to re-register, and when you ask people why do you think they are doing this, everyone uh, that we spoke to believed it was political. And then the rise of disinformation, just because of how much uh, young people are using social media platforms, platforms such as TikTok has been recorded to be having the most misinformation, disinformation, and hate speech, and that is mainly around new voters. Laws and rules, I've already talked about how much is being used in financing. And the fact that there's no regulations, the Finance Campaigning Act is something that we have pretty much shelved and we are beginning to see how it's having an impact on the ground. Um, people are not being able to mobilize without resources or UNGA or some commodities. And I've also seen politicians moving their meetings outside, especially members of parliament, outside their constituency, just so that they can control the crowd. There've been a number of reports of young people coming, especially youth who belong to border, border circles or gangs, coming and invading the meetings and demanding for money. The parallel tally, I think that will be interesting. The fact that this time around, IBC has said that um, they want, or 
they are supporting or open to people having their own sort of tally that IBC is the only one who can declare the winner, but everyone can have their own results coming in. I think it's a move towards transparency, but also it means, you know, how is it going to be managed? It's a little bit worrying there. And so final results, uh, are people going to trust the results that come out? And that's because of the electronic transmission, the issues that we've had previously, and also looking at electronic transmission, the fact that not everyone or not everywhere has access to it, or how we are seeing a lot of back and forth in terms of how the commission has sorted that. So when we look at this, this is what the NCIC, in terms of the research, the fact that the potential for violence or election related violence. So the center of fake news doesn't surprise me that it's Nairobi and Nakuru that come out top. But for the most volatile, it's um, you know both from where Honorable Ray lives from and DP Ruto is from. So those are the two areas that are sort of on the radar with NCIC. And then Mombasa normally remains because of the high number of criminal gangs. So when we look at the voting process as a whole, this is one election where 39.8% is young people and it's a decline from the last election. Uh, for me, this is uh, a worry. Uh, we know that the apathy was high, but I really wasn't expecting it to be this high, even though I'm in the sector. And for me, uh, very different from 2017, because at least then the youth were actually a voting block of almost 50%. So them being 39.8% and meaning there's never a 100 voter percent turnout, that if we have even 30% of young people engaging in this election, that was a good turnout. So we're going to have a low youth turnout because they're already low in number. And I've already shared that there's a rise in independent candidates. And so ORPP had to vet 47 presidential candidates who are buying independent and 7,000 of them independent candidates from various seats. And a number of them have gone through. We've already shared on the electronic voting and the fact that um, Azimio took this matter to court because of you know, some issues of people maybe not having a fingerprint and what is the next step if that was to happen or if there's an issue, people still feel that IBC is not very clear in that. And sharing information, uh, social media and the rise in it, the fact that IBC does have an MOU with media this time around, trying to keep this process open. They've also permitted for individuals to be recording uh, what's happening in the different polling stations to take pictures, uh, even though legally you are not supposed to be able to have your phone in the polling station and take pictures. So this is going to be different depending on how it's managed. We've already shared on the 46,233 polling stations and the number of them. This is also the first time where we have three women who are deputy candidates. We've never ever seen that before. It's actually historic. So here are the concerns. So ELOG commends IBC, but they believe that IBC is not ready. So the second simulation done, the only, so the first one we all know it failed. Um, it didn't go according to plan. So they did a second one and they only used 580 kids. It went well, but compared to the 46,000, that exist in the polling stations, they feel that that number was just too low. It doesn't represent uh, whether they passed or failed. They just basically use a very small sample number. And then the delays of a comprehensive voter registration. So this is not yet in the, the, the public, the voter registrar. So ELOG does feel that IBC needs to share this to the public. It's supposed to be accessible, but it's not. And it's also bringing about tension and also the timely training and deployment of polling officials. That hasn't been done yet. And we are about 14 days uh, to the election. So it's also worrying uh, considering that we're running out of time. And um, that's basically a video to the press release that was done by ELOG. But I'm sure you've seen uh, the IBC perception crisis with the traveling Venezuelans and not quite sure what they're carrying, how they got here or traveled with passports that had expired. So there are a lot of questions making a lot of people nervous and the battle between this 
and also how voter education is currently being done. It started quite late. It actually started in end of uh, IEC materials were not ready. And also the fact that a lot of young people feel that they didn't have access to IDs. So that needs to be changed for young people to be able to participate. So this is the final slide. Uh, when it comes to the possible scenarios, so the scenarios that I have in mind, uh, people mostly feel that it's as you know, that's gonna go for the win. That's the most expected result, just because of the state influence and support uh, behind as you know. And if Kenya Kwanzaa was to pull it off, people would be surprised, uh, but then they also feel that it could happen. But that reaction would be a lot harder to accept. Uh, we're talking about public officials. I've talked about CSB sharing openly um, campaigning and a lot of them. So what would it mean for their jobs? If Kenya Kwanzaa was to come in, um, it's it's something that we worry about a little bit in terms of people accepting that result and whether it will be accepted. And then the possible runoff, uh, Wajakoya the fifth. And so if he does create the opportunity for a runoff, because you know, we have to have 50 plus one. And if none of the candidates are able to reach 15 plus one, um, that is also a scary scenario. And the postponement, there's still a lot of back and forth with uh, Kigame and pushing for a reprint of ballot papers and so many other things um, that could cause postponement. Some of them I don't want to speak into the universe, but also something for a possible scenario. So I think my time is up, and those are the thoughts that I have. Thank you very much. Back to you, John. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Nerima, uh, for quite an elaborate presentation that you've done. Also bringing out the facts uh, of uh, the ge geographical risks uh, talk of uh, the scenarios that have been created uh, across the country, uh, but some statistics that I've seen, uh, uh, I would say that we need probably to, to look into them uh, so that then we can uh, bring the credibility of the elections. Like now, when you took over 53% level of confidence uh, that you are likely to have, uh, electro, we can have electoral disputes. Uh, then it begs the question of what is the government and various stakeholders doing, uh, so that uh, we can lower this uh, to the uh, to the uh, to the bare, bare minimum. Uh, or when uh, you are pointing out of the volatile areas, uh, the criminal gang proliferation, uh, uh, mention of Wasingi issue, Mobasa, uh, and many other uh, counties uh, whereby our members are present. So it's a question of then what is being done so that we can uh, curb possible effects of this from affecting business operations. Uh, question of are right measures being taken already to deter the disputes? Uh, and also that ELOC, uh, the Electoral Observation Group, uh, it's not, believes that uh, EIBC is not ready for the, the, for the elections. Uh, these are things that are happening before the elections and uh, we have control on how we can increase uh, the level of confidence uh, going forward. Uh, thanks so much, Nerima, for that presentation. At this point, so now uh, I want to invite uh, Tony Blair, East Africa Regional Director, uh, Roni Osumba, uh, to also make some remarks for the next 12 minutes. Thanks, John. Uh, thanks, Chair, and everybody uh, for joining. Um, definitely an important conversation for us to be having. Um, and, you know, sometimes it, 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 it boggles my mind how, when we are going through these election processes, we never invest sufficient time um, to think through what our foreign policy is, and particularly how it relates to our neighbors. So in the next couple of minutes, I am going to try and speak through some of the implications of what this election would do to our relationships, but also how we think beyond the election in terms of the candidates and the parties we want to invest in because there are some serious businesses uh, to be uh, taken care of 
I mean, most of you as members of the manufacturing community will know that uh, every election cycle, and I think Kwame already alluded to it, there's disruption to business, but the largest disruption is really in the logistics space and the movement of goods and people. We can already see in this particular election, a lot of countries in the region are choosing to shift their produce or goods from the port of Mombasa to the port of Jerusalem so that they can be able to use the central corridor. Um, and, 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 you know, this is definitely a cause for concern for us. In future, we possibly need to build a strategy around how we manage um, the disruption that the election brings to the transport corridor. We can see the impact that the Ukraine uh, war is having on the region. And again, this is a serious, I think, geopolitical, but also global consideration that we need to put into place as we pick the next administration. Just thinking about, you know, what are the new energy markets? Uh, Europe is already looking towards um, Africa uh, to supply alternative uh, uh, alternative energy products. Um, again, Kwame spoke about the disruption that we have seen in the grain uh, supply chain, and you know, definitely time for us to start rethinking uh, how we build alternative sources in the region. COVID obviously taught us a lot of lessons, um, particularly in the industrialization and manufacturing space. How do we build the capacity of the region? Um, to begin to add value to products, particularly with a focus on import substitution. The benefit of it obviously is immense, um, but particularly in job creation, but also in having things that we can own. So whether that's made in Rwanda, made in Kenya initiatives, um, we need to start thinking about an East Africa approach to the same. But let me just also share now, uh, hopefully very rapidly, key developments and trends in the region. We now have a very youthful population in the region. Um, the average age of the voter or of a citizen in uh, the average age of a citizen in the region is not about 19. Uganda's average age is 17 years old. This shows you how dynamic uh, the youth population is in whatever we do, whether it's through the electoral process or economic planning, there's significant demographic, demographic, demographic shift. Uh, and in the last couple of years, the region has seen 70, in the last 10 years, 70 million uh, new young people. Um, and obviously we have also seen massive shifts in the investments that we are making, particularly around the infrastructure. So whether, you know, you go to Dar es Salaam, uh, Kampala, uh, Kigali, you know, Addis, there's a lot of investments that uh, governments are doing around urbanization driven by um, um, the heterogeneous populations that are found in these cities. Uh, there's significant push for uh, a shift in the governance uh, of the countries in the region. And all this is making the region easily one of the most dynamic on the continent. We have not seen the amount of significant shifts we're seeing now over the last uh, 30 or so years. So let me shift to a bit of the politics and see, you know, what this means for whoever is going to be taking over after the elections. In Ethiopia, obviously, you have a crisis going on there. Prime Minister B is still trying to get a balance uh, with the Tigrayans. They have found, you know, a common understanding in at least opening up the Tigray region for humanitarian efforts. Whoever is coming in into Kenya, uh, Kenya's uh, state house, is going to have to take over from President Kenyatta. Uh, obviously, both sides had a significant level of trust. And for example, now the Tigrays have said any reconciliation with Prime Minister Abi has to be negotiated in Nairobi. So this is uh, going to be something that is going to be high on the agenda. Prime Minister Abi has delayed in naming a reconciliation committee precisely because he is waiting for the outcome of the Kenyan election. Uh, you know, you have the Guard project. Um, that is pitting uh, Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt 
As we speak, the Somali president is in Egypt uh, trying to build new relationships uh, with the Egyptians, and this will possibly have an effect on uh, the relationship between Ethiopia and Sudan. So definitely something that the new occupant of state house will have to put uh, their focus on. Obviously, this regional peace and security situations are important because without them, it doesn't matter how much democratic and economic uh, um, uh, development you put in place, they will be disrupted uh, with some of these um, happenings around us. In Eritrea, obviously now uh, uh, President uh, um, Isaias is seeing the possible relationship or reconciliation between Abiy and Tigray as uh, an existential threat uh, because it then threatens the Tripartite Alliance, which was between Somalia, Ethiopia, and Eritrea, and therefore is beginning to invest significantly in destabilizing that new relationship, but also trying to keep Somalia out of the negotiation negotiation table. Uh, so last week, they entered into a defense deal with the Somalis. Um, and uh, Pre President um, uh, Hassan Sheikh, as he builds his you know, new alliances across the region, will look at this relationship as a critical one for him, uh, particularly because of the defense relationship. But President Isaias is also providing alternative uh, port routes uh, and could therefore push for Russia to invest in a northern corridor uh, for trade routes within the region. Uh, this obviously is not going to be a very welcome uh, initiative uh, to the Europeans specifically, and therefore Kenya will have to find a suitable uh, mechanism to negotiate with uh, Eritrea. Sudan is all, obviously always the stubborn baby in the room, and uh, you know, with the journey that they started in 2012, there's an opportunity to invest a little bit more to ensure that the relationship now, after the coup last year, between the military government and the civilian leadership uh, is managed well. Um, um, the opportunity, I think, for investors and the business community in Sudan obviously is helping them reconstruct their financial um, um, structures. But with the Nairobi International Financial Center, perhaps an opportunity to uh, have a conversation um, uh, with, the, with the Sudanese. Um, I think there's also, you know, the conversation around the Nile waters and the disputed borders between Kenya and Sudan, uh, the moves that uh, Ethiopia is making with GAD should be of an interest to us. Um, we want to ensure that whoever is the occupant of state house gets on top of this conversation um, on day one. Uh, South Sudan obviously experiencing a long transition. Uh, the international community has stopped investing in SS. Uh, SS is part of the East Africa community and uh, EGAD. Uh, Kenya has an interest to ensure that there is uh, peace in South Sudan only if uh, to ensure that our oil and energy ambitions uh, stay on course. Uh, Somalia, obviously, um, opportunity here for a new Somalia. Uh, President Hassan uh, Sheikh has been pulling all the right moves. They've now made an uh, investment in um, joining the East Africa community. I absolutely see President Kenyatta's handprints all over that move. But whoever will be the occupant of State House post August obviously has um, uh, this particular issue to address, but also to see how Kenya strategically positions uh, with Somalia into uh, the future. In Uganda, the big headache there for Kenya obviously is that uh, uh, with President Museveni, uh, you know, posturing uh, for uh, you know leaving office how do we build that relationship? Um, we've been seeing President Kenyatta re, uh, building a relationship with uh, General Muguzi, who is uh, President Museveni's son, and whoever will be the occupant of the new office will want to consider whether that's an in, 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 uh, relationship we want to invest in. Um, what that relationship means with Kagame, obviously, in Kigali, uh, the birthday party, which many of us probably saw, where Kagame attended, immediately followed up 
by opening of the borders between Uganda and Rwanda is, I think, a significant um, happening and could point to what the future lies with uh, Uganda. In Rwanda, obviously, the tech powerhouse, um, Kigali is investing significantly in building an innovation city that could be disruptive to Kenya's uh, Silicon Savannah. Um, President Kagame is making significant investments in the Made in Rwanda uh, initiative that could see Rwanda become the manufacturing and industrialization powerhouse. I mean, obviously, they do not have the market, but it would be interesting to see what moves they make. If Kenya is bidding for the same, uh, obviously, the next occupant of the state house will have to work with all of you in the manufacturing community to see how we position ourselves, either in partnership with Rwanda or to upstage them. Uh, obviously, Rwanda is moving on to vaccine manufacturing and expanding that with various partnerships into pharmaceutical manufacturing, something definitely to keep an eye on. Um, in Tanzania, obviously, the balance of trade has now shifted. Uh, President Kenyatta has built a good relationship with President Sluhu, and we are seeing, you know, the, the Magufuli days um, trade embargoes uh, being uh, pulled down one by one, but this has worked uh, in favor of Kenya. Yeah, this has worked more in favor of Tanzania than uh, in favor of Kenya. And obviously, you know, we, we as uh, an economy will have to think about what our competitive advantage over Tanzania is. Um, President Zulu has been making a lot of foreign trips uh, to the US and to Europe, uh, seeking investors. Um, they are be being looked at very lucratively by the European market as an alternative source for oil and gas. Um, and so Tanzania will, in their new posture, become very competitive uh, in the near future. Finally, obviously, there's the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, with the Eastern Congo um, uh, security crisis um, and DRC having joined uh, the ESC recently. Everyone is excited about the new market of 100 million people. But for us to get to the Western and Central sides of DRC from a trade perspective, the Eastern Congo situation needs to be resolved. The parties, of course, again, have agreed for the peace process, what is called the Nairobi process, to be based and steered from Nairobi. And only last week, the East African heads of states appointed President Kenyatta as a special envoy post his presidency to deal with the, to manage and steer the Nairobi process. So obviously, I mean, if you think about it, a lot of dynamics in the region uh, that will be hot on the plate of the new occupant of State House from day one, which have massive implication on Kenya's positioning as the uh, regional hub and an economic giant, but also on our ambitions around uh, tech and manufacturing. I think my time is up. I could uh, have been happier to have had more time, but I guess that's all we have time for and happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ronald. Uh, you've given us a very good uh, dissection uh, of how the neighboring countries are performing, what is the stake of uh, the region of peace and security, uh, done justice to the geoeconomics and uh, geopolitical analysis uh, of uh, the regional uh, landscape. Uh, also noting that uh, various trade routes are being established uh, within the region uh, so that uh, we can, besides having uh, the trade facilitation mechanism that uh, we're discussing with right now, Kenya Revenue Authority and other revenue bodies, and even other re re regulators, uh, we have the routes mapped out uh, uh, well for, for us to take advantage of this. Thanks so much uh, for that presentation. So members, we now we have come, come at a point that uh, we are now going to pick uh, questions and answers. And uh, uh, the members present on the call, uh, the panelists present on the call are ready to, to answer to these questions. Remember when we started off, we noted that uh, once you type a question in the, in the chat function of the Zoom, 
uh, you can indicate the name uh, of the, the, the panelist that would like to respond to your question. And it's good now we take this advantage of this uh, so that we can get as much clarification as possible on the issues uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, that are disturbing, disturb, disturbing us daily. Uh, so let me check uh, the chat box and also Q&A box to see whether there's any question that has come up. Yes, I see there is a comment on a question uh, that uh, the government is calling it a stabilization fund, not subsidy. Uh, KRA should reduce the taxation on petrol and petroleum uh, products. They charge almost 60% uh, on the commodity. Uh, very good comment there that uh, instead of uh, having uh, uh, the stabilization fund, uh, we can have the taxation uh, reduced on the petroleum and petroleum products. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and subsequently, we see the reduction on the cost, uh, the, the cost of production and the cost of doing business and also inflation rate in the, in the country. Um, there's another one uh, uh, indicating that Kwame speaks to the resilience of the manufacturing sector, sector post-COVID to an, uh, to an extended uh, electoral uh, season, seeing IBC weakness. So Kwame, the first question comes to you. Uh, it's about uh, how would you speak about the manufacturing sector after, uh, after the, the, the COVID at the same time, uh, what, what, what will it be, or what the, does it pose uh, to have still effects of the, of the COVID? At the same time, we have the, ele uh, the election uh, coming up. Kwame, that's, that, that's your question. All right, um, okay. Um, well, actually about the resilience of manufacturing after, after COVID, it should have been answered by, by a manufacturer, but this is my goal. Uh, <clears throat> It's true that um, agriculture and agriculture processing, especially food processing, is a big part of Kenya's manufacturing sector. And so if you have uh, uh, the two crises, or rather the two failed rains, and obviously a reduction in agricultural uh, inputs, uh, then obviously that has a knock-on effect. And you can see that's part of the reason why there's a significant, I mean, there's a big discussion about what how the imports come in and whether um, manufacturing farms, especially the millers, have a sufficient um, uh, risk flour, flour or raw material to actually be able to convert it to flour. So I think uh, the truth is the elections, COVID and um, the debt crisis and obviously the inflation all came at once. And as soon as we were getting a bouncing back from the country was bouncing back from COVID. Then we have the elections available, and obviously we have the invasion of Ukraine. So all those are added pressure. So there's not been sufficient time for everybody to actually recover and hold their breath. But regardless, that's that's how things are. We can't control everything else. And for me, what it tells me is uh, Kenya is classified as, a, of course, a small uh, open economy, and small open economies need to be always very very cautious in the way government direct expenditure specifically and the fiscal deficits that we've had. So all those things have collided in a way that is almost a conspiracy to make us pull harder. And so, yes, it's going to be much, much more difficult than it would have been otherwise. Uh, but the good thing was it seemed towards the end of last year, based on the data that uh, 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 manufacturing was actually recovering, regardless of the fact that it was recovering from a low base, but that recovery was essential. I hope that these elections, and if you look at from 2007 specifically, or the 2002, uh, with the exception of 2007, each election year has had a lower disruption uh, than the previous one. Um, so if that maintains, I think this year with the vigilance, that is all required, we need to be entirely vigilant, uh, pressure on the IABC to be more transparent, uh, only then would the result be trusted, and only then would uh, even the court processes, if they must go there, uh, be resolved in time to allow everybody to recover. So it's essential to the extent that it's possible to actually manage the elections program from now to once until the results almost flawlessly. And we just have to cross our fingers that it happens because yes, economic recovery and gaining momentum and resilience for the manufacturing sector as well depends on it. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kwame. Uh, we have uh, Fatima Yamani uh, asking kindly, uh, that uh, Narima revisits the hotspots fight. So Narima, can you share with that uh, slide with us? It seems uh, to attract interest uh, from uh, the participants. Yes, uh, sure. Uh, let me back. 
But I do have to mention that even though on the slides, I talk about what NCIC has considered to be hotspots from their research, I do have to mention that people feel that the hotspots are going to change or they're going to be different. And this is because when I talked about zoning, for instance, there we go. And this is because when I talked about zoning, for instance, I'll give you an example of Homa Bay, uh, when we had the direct nomination to Gladys Waka, the fact that Kidero is on independent and it seemed to be very close, there's a sort of uh, rebellion on the ground uh, to push for him to go into to be governor. So we are seeing a lot of uh, violence in a lot of the political gatherings. I can say the same for Madari. And so there are places where even Kibra, for instance, uh, where Mariga was campaigning and he had uh, called people into a meeting and youth groups came and stormed it and he broke his arm uh, because he was campaigning in uh, Raila's bedroom. So there's a lot of those small cases um, for different levels across the board from MCA to MP. But this is what NCAC reports to be the ones to be on the lookout for. Uh, but I do believe that we might have instances, especially when the results come out of small uh, conflicts. I don't wanna call them hotspots, but small places of conflict that will be recorded for sure, for sure. Thank you, thank you, Larima, for, for, for taking us through that. Uh, and I hope it's to the satisfaction of uh, Fatima. Uh, I want also to ask this question to the immediate uh, CAM board chair. Uh, it's about uh, the, the regional trend as far as the elections are concerned. Uh, uh, and it is, uh, what, uh, what is the effect of the Kenya elections on, to, on our neighboring countries like Tanzania, Uganda, uh, where our manufacturers uh, normally uh, supply their goods and uh, some of them have, in, have invested uh, in some of these countries. And because there could be concerns, uh, because we have seen even the, deb the debates uh, taking place even in the respective uh, parliaments of the state of the uh, Kenyan elections. How can we boost guarantee of fair elections to neighboring countries so that we can guarantee business continuity? Okay, thanks, Job. Um, I think we, we, we learned quite a lot from um, Ronnie as well, that uh, Kenya, we are centrally placed. We do talk a lot about ourselves being a country that is important for the region. And sometimes we overlook that, uh, how important it is, how important we are and uh, what we need to do. I think in terms of regionally, obviously Rwanda, Uganda, and maybe Eastern Congo are more wary about our elections because it has a huge impact on their supply chains. So they are very concerned always about um, how far we'll get. And I think if you remember, I think in 2008, there was the stories that the Ugandan military actually went to Kisumu to collect fuel for their country when it looked like it was, um, or at least they threatened to, I don't know if they actually did it, but it was important for them to get fuel. So it's important for them that Kenya continues. Tanzania, um, less so. But on the other hand, I think it's fair to say outside of uh, Tanzania, Tanzania has a semi-democratic process. We have probably the most fully open democratic process in the region. So countries are also looking and just seeing how we are managing this, how we are able to do it. So in a sense, we are we are uh, we ought to be an inspiration to the progressives, people who want more democratic space opened up in the region, and they want to see how we are able to do this on our own. And therefore, we just emphasize what the other uh, speaker said earlier about how it is important for IEBC to do its work well, but also for us to be able to support it and all the other institutions around it to support it in what it is doing so that we can achieve a credible election. Even in the end, whenever we've had disruptions, it's always about the credibility of the election. If you have a credible election, as we did in 2003, to, to a large extent in 2013 as well, you have less, um, 
less challenges post election as well. So thanks. Ah, th th thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Mushai. And uh, now I turn uh, the mic to uh, the current chair, Mr. Joshua, uh, on on one question uh, about. Uh, therefore, what are the best practices during the elections and how will come, come in uh, or Kenya's issue manufacturers come in to ensure all workers get an opportunity to exercise their voting rights? Okay, thanks, Job. Uh, when, when we talk about best practices, I think the most important thing from a manufacturer's point of view, we employ a lot of workers and uh, one of the things we have been advocating for is to be, uh, to preach peace through our members, uh, through, through our uh, workers. And this is something that is a discussion which uh, we continuously having through our chapters to relate to our members that our, we, we have a, a duty to play uh, as uh, manufacturers to ensure that uh, peace prevails. Um, the other areas around uh, uh, election preparedness, I mean, there is also discussions going around that in the event that there is some, uh, some pockets where the skirmish is, what kind of uh, interventions we should take, uh, how to protect our employees uh, 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 against harm and ensuring that uh, also the properties of our members are well protected around that. These are uh, some of the ongoing discussions we, 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 we have with our members around business continuity. Uh, but at the end of the day, we, we, we also are, through the message of peace, we want to reduce the risk of those kind of eventualities to happen. Uh, regarding the question of uh, the workers' rights, I think uh, we, we have to be cognizant of the fact that every citizen has a it's democratic right to go and vote, and uh, that right needs to be exercised. And uh, 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 we, the employers, need to be cognizant of that. Now, of course, uh, we are also awaiting uh, the details around uh, uh, what uh, the government plans to do around uh, around uh, making um, certain days uh, uh, as public holidays. But I think uh, from, from our point of view, uh, we shall ensure that our members do facilitate their workers to uh, exercise their democratic right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rajan. Uh, and before I turn to, Os, uh, to Osuba uh, on a question that has been directed to him, there is uh, an anonymous attendee who has noted that election preparedness is an issue that should be, be undertaken as soon as one election is done. Taking, note, taking notes from the success and failures of an, of an election event. Do members of CAMP feel the IBC is ready? Uh, and because now we don't have uh, uh, an anonymous uh, streaming of uh, views from our members, uh, you can choose uh, to type uh, the chat or the question box uh, your feeling about the state, uh, the, the, the state of uh, IBC readiness uh, to conduct uh, the elections. But if you want to hold your opinion, still that is welcome. Uh, that's a suggestion that is coming from an anonymous attendee. Uh, turning to uh, Mr. Osuba, please speak on the role debt will play in, the, in this election uh, recovery, considering the recent IIMF guidelines that have been given to the National Treasury. I mean, from a from very purely political you know, perspective, I think of, obviously it has been made a political issue right and it has been used to um, um, judge the current administration but as a determining factor i'm not quite sure that it it is that significant um obviously you know kwame is probably in a better position to talk about what then the future looks like in terms of how debt uh, is to be managed and particularly considering the you know uh, implications of the IMF guidelines but in from where I am seated I think the appetite and the ambition of the country to continue to grow and invest in some of these big push projects um, will continue irrespective of which administration comes in um, I think the bigger question if this is to be a political 
um, consideration is how will that debt be managed? How do we ensure that we're getting return on investments uh, from some of these projects? Uh, but from a purely, purely electoral political perspective, I don't see it playing a critical role uh, in the elections. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Ronald, uh, for making that clarification. Uh, looking at uh, the chat box, uh, the Q and A uh, box. I don't see. Uh, we, 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 I don't see uh, further questions uh, displayed. Uh, so I'm giving uh, more opportunity for members to ask uh, further questions before we close this session. Any other question coming up? Yeah, I can see from the information you have. What security measures should business and investors uh, put in place? That is uh, from Fatima Yatami uh, is asking. From the information you have, what security measures should business and investors uh, put in place? And I think uh, I'm going to throw this question to Marima. I hope I'm not throwing you to deep end uh, to attempt uh, an answer. You are, because I know nothing about business, but I do feel that what I see is a lot of misinformation that is circulating. And I'll give an example of one that I saw on, on WhatsApp that I feel because we have access to a lot of people or customers or even family members, we are not sharing accurate information enough. And one that I saw in relation to elections is uh, there are some sneaky IBC officials who, you know, be careful that when you vote on that day, if your ballot paper is not stamped at the back, it will be counted as a spoiled vote. This is absolutely correct. And the thing that I do not like about that statement is that the IBC officials are sneaky. Uh, people need to make sure that at least it's, it's stamped. And I see Rodi has put his hand up, so he'll answer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, indeed, on the same, uh, there's a question of uh, uh, businesses and investors uh, linking up with uh, as much as possible with the uh, sub-county and county uh, intelligence and the uh, security committees. Uh, we're talking about uh, the OCPDs, the OCSs, uh, having uh, direct communication with them uh, so that you get uh, uh, the right information in time uh, in terms of uh, the security and the safety uh, in terms of the investments and also in terms of movements. And also you have seen like now the information that the RIMA has, pro has brought out uh, concerning the volatile areas. It's not uh, information that we can just ignore uh, when we hear an area is more volatile than the other, uh, or even the spreading more, more misinformation than the other. Uh, all these need to be checked uh, so that uh, the more volatile an area is, the more you have put uh, physical uh, personal uh, security measures in place. Uh, I can see also uh, Ronald's hand is up. No, it's down now. Uh, Tobias, you, uh, Tobias, you want to respond to the same issue? Well, yeah. I just wanted. Okay, oh, let's, let's go. Ronald, Ronald, go first. Ronald, go first. Okay. Now, I just wanted to, you know, piggyback on on Nerima's tea up to just say I think as a business, really, there's very little, and I see somebody else has asked, what role can businesses play? I think there's very little control over the political volatility of the season. Um, and for businesses, I think what is most critical is to ensure that you have your ops and security plans in place and that your you know, personnel, your staff, your, your drivers and all your partners are aware of what this, um, you know, what this ops plan is so that when it, when they need to respond, they're not second guessing and you're not beginning to look for people in advance. So this is, I mean, your typical business continuity planning, I think is your best insurance rather than trying to see how you could influence uh, some of these external factors. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Tobias? Yeah, so just, just to add, because during um, election, the most challenging area that business face is the logistics. So uh, as KM, we have established an election preparedness uh, committee uh, that is focusing on pre and post elections. And within that committee, we've established uh, uh, network, uh, networks, 
uh, which will lie us with our security agencies across the re region. So like we've done in the past, we intend to keep our members updated um, on what is happening around the election time and even after elections uh, in terms of enabling you to move your goods um, um, without any challenge or without any, fee, any fear. So just be assured that we will keep you posted, posted during the period of election and after election. We also have a member's help desk. Uh, this will be a platform that you can call in or send an email to anytime or WhatsApp in case there are any challenges, but also a platform to update you on the status of issues. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, uh, Tobias. And uh, at this time, I would like to uh, call this uh, meeting to end. And uh, before we finalize, I would like to request all the panelists uh, I left behind before, after we have closed the meeting. And uh, most uh, sincere thanks uh, to uh, Ronnie Asuba, the Regional Director for East Africa Tonobila Institute, Institute for, uh, for Global Change, uh, to Neri Mawako, uh, who is the MD for Siaza Place, uh, to Kwame Owino, uh, who is the CEO of uh, uh, Institute of Economic Affairs, and our own board chair, uh, Mr. Jansha, and the immediate uh, past chair, uh, Mr. Mushai Kuniha, uh, for your contribution uh, during uh, this webinar. To our members who are present uh, on the call uh, and uh, the, the, the very uh, important question that you have raised, uh, we thank you. And uh, we can guarantee you that uh, we will be trying as much as possible to appraise you uh, on the election uh, preparedness so that we can ensure there is a business uh, continuity uh, and also ensure that our operations are not disrupted before, uh, during and after the general elections. Uh, and uh, as we started uh, is that uh, we have the right to vote. Uh, so uh, I would expect that uh, as majority of us, uh, given the convenience, uh, will be able to participate in this because uh, in the absence of voting, still you'll have voted. Uh, so let's uh, divide uh, or let's take uh, one side uh, of, of, uh, of, the, of the divide uh, so that we can have, uh, we can also participate in political decision making. Uh, so thank you so much and we have come to the end uh, of this webinar uh, and have a good uh, good afternoon and evening Job, do we have our panelists only? Or? Uh, no, we have that five members still on the call. Oh, okay. Yeah, so. Or, or there is a way that you can just. Okay. Yeah, uh, Grace, you so can. I think there must, you... Yeah, I think there must be a way.